Very good. Well, uh, thank you, Lucy, and thanks to everyone in the uh, the wider Liverpool um, uh, group and audience. Um, my greetings to you and uh, to everyone um, who's listening in. Um, let me start with a, a hope that you're taking good care of yourself, your family, friends, neighbors, wherever you are living, wherever they may, may be as well. Um, at the, uh, the Smithsonian, uh, it's a, a snowy day here in the Washington DC area, unusual, but uh, there's lots of unusual things that are going on that have been going on. And at the Smithsonian, we've had no, uh, no visitors, no public visitors to the museums, um, no access to our offices or labs uh, since last March. In fact, I was just figuring out that it was exactly on this date uh, in uh, March uh, that 11, so 11 months ago, uh, that uh, we haven't had access uh, to um, to our research, usual research environment. Yet we push on. We were able to have a virtual field season in uh, in Kenya by my being on the phone every evening with uh, my uh, our our crew and colleagues, uh, Kenyan colleagues who were out searching for fossils and doing risk assessment of our ongoing excavations. When I'm there, <clears throat> uh, so that was uh, that was productive. Uh, they found. Uh, you know, 20 or 30 fossils worth collecting. They thought oh, every single one of them was a hominin fossil. None of them are, I'm pretty sure. But in any case, I look forward to looking at that collection when I'm able to travel back there. In any case, we've all figured out ways to, uh, to stay in touch with one another and to stay sane. And uh, this is a, a, great, uh, a great venue um, to, uh, to be able to, to do that. What I'd uh, like to do is to give then an account of an intellectual journey that I've been on for a considerable part of my uh, career. Um, it's a story that is uh, both data-driven as well as conceptual and, uh, and theoretical about uh, hominin uh, adaptive uh, evolution uh, and its, uh, its environmental context. Um, and so the Actually, let's see, I need to do something with my screen here, press continue. Um, so so um, the story um, begins when I, I got to the, uh, to the Smithsonian after teaching at, at Yale University for a, uh, a few years and um, began uh, conducting field work in, uh, in, in Kenya and in Southern Kenya. Um, and, um, in well, quite a while, long time ago, 1985, um, began research in the Alorgasili Basin, uh, located in southern Kenya. You see a location map of where it is in southern Kenya, on the lower left hand of the screen, uh, and uh, you can see the uh, layer after layer of um, uh, environments um, that uh, preserve uh, stone artifacts and fossilized uh, bones. Uh, and uh, many, many different um, environmental uh, records um, that we've been able to obtain uh, from, these, um, uh, from these sediments. In the upper left-hand corner, you can see where that red arrow is pointing. Uh, my, uh, my home away from home, um, every summer for the past 36 years, except for last year, um, and probably this year as well, um, we put up our tented camp and uh, usually do about uh, two months of, um, of excavation, geological field work, um, whole variety of scientists uh, and uh, students and um, Kenyan colleagues, especially involved in the, uh, in the project. Uh, and so our, our work, um, just showing one of our um, many, actually hundreds of excavations and geological trenches that have been dug over the years, one of the excavations there, in the foreground, Mount Alorgasili in the background, um, having mapped all the volcanic rocks up on the highlands that uh, were used as uh, sources of um, stone for uh, making um, uh, large cutting tools, hand axes, and so on, and a ver variety of other aspects of Acheulean technology. Um, and um, once we realized, um, I thought it was, I was going to be there for three years uh, working. Um, it was a, thought to be a, a fairly short time frame at Alorgas Ailey, about uh, half a million years old, um, known, written up in textbooks as a baboon butchery site. Um, but um, I realized that there was a lot of 
a lot of sediment there. And it was really at the beginning of the uh, single crystal argon, argon um, uh, dating method, um, the advent of that. And the Lorgus Eiley was the first sequence in East Africa that was dated through that, through the, uh, the terrific work of uh, our colleague, uh, Alan Dano at the Berkeley uh, Geochronology Lab um, or center, I should say, Berkeley Geochronology Center. And um, uh, so after about uh, two and a half years, we realized that we had more than a million years of time uh, represented at the Lorgus Eiley. And so that really began my process of, of adjusting, uh, and retooling myself in the environmental sciences uh, in order to investigate how did early humans um, adjust to environmental dynamics over the past uh, 1 million years, actually back to uh, about 1.2 million years ago. Uh, and so uh, there are lots of different sorts of things that have been found, of course, over the years in the major time frame of the Acheulean that's represented at Alorgus Eiley, beginning 1.2 million years to about 500,000 years ago. We have, um, you know, classic Acheulean uh, hand axes and cleavers, picks, knives, uh, those large cutting tools, as well as, of course, a variety of other um, uh, kinds of uh, artifacts uh, that are um, associated with the, uh, uh, typically with the Acheulean. Um, and a, a very excellent fossil record of, uh, of animals, but it's patchily distributed through time. Uh, but you see there the um, extinct uh, zebra Equus oldoviensis, um, a really excellent um, cranial and skeletal material um, that have been collected, um, um, that has been collected through the sequence at Allurgus Eiley. Uh, large other uh, grazing um, animals such as uh, elephants or what's often called Paleoloxodon recchi. Um, a uh, fossil elephant uh, that uh, became extinct, at least in the southern Kenya Rift Valley, um, in a, um, a skeleton and a butchery site that we have dated to about 550,000 years ago. Uh, we have uh, very little in the way of uh, hominin fossil material. This is, uh, you see this uh, uh, frontal uh, fragment looking at you. Um, uh, from uh, 900,000 years ago that has, um, although it's small, it has classic markers of, uh, of Homo erectus morphology um, in, the, uh, in the brain case, the temporal, reg temporal region in particular. And let me also um, put out as a teaser, and I'll mention this a little bit later also, a fossil that has not yet been published um, from 615,000 years ago in member 11 of the Allurgus Sile formation. Um, and it's a specimen that we're, uh, we're, we're working on now uh, from a variety of standpoints, some morphological, perhaps even proteomics, we will see uh, whether we can um, uh, get research on that, uh, that done. Uh, but it comes at a very interesting time period. Um, and so um, in walking up and down these slopes at Alorgus Eiley in the early years of the, the work there, um, I realized that there was a lot of different kinds of environments uh, represented there. I went there thinking that, okay, we're going to see grassland, 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 layer after layer, and see what, what the Acheulean hominins were doing on a largely uh, grassland environment. Um, but um, in digging geological trenches, such as in a, um, you know, even just in a small uh, part of uh, the outcrop here on this particular hillside, this hillside representing about 10,000 years of time with um, <clears throat> dated um, uh, volcanic ash layers and pumices at the bottom and the top of this, uh, of this hillside. Uh, so about 10,000 years of time, and one can see this kind of back and forth between um, dry grassland soils on the basis of, uh, ox of uh, the carbon isotopic uh, composition of the soils, uh, to the analysis of diatoms, uh, volcanic ashes that would cover the landscape, killing off all the grasses. Uh, the lake, a uh, very deep lake comes back and then there's a, a drought that lasted for about, we think about 500 years and then uh, the back to a, a deep lake. And all of a sudden this idea of um, environmental, the, how dynamic the environment was um, came into my, my thinking. Um, and uh, this led me to, um, as I was retooling in the environmental sciences, to um, try to wrap my mind around a whole variety of um, uh, climate records and overall environmental uh, records. This is just one example um, that a variety of people helped me to, uh, to understand the, 
Uh, the Sapropel record um, drilled, generally obtained by drilling in the Mediterranean and the uh, Eastern Mediterranean. This actually is an upthrusted, um, uh, upfaulted um, uh, bit on the Northern side of the Mediterranean. Uh, showing the Sapropel uh, record, but in, uh, in, in outcrop form. Uh, but the main records that I've um, explored are ones that go back about 5 million um, years. And uh, you can see that the, what Sapropels are, um, that as a result of the um, extrusion of um, uh, wet uh, and organic uh, rich matter from um, the Nile in particular, which um, is uh, the catchment for the Nile is the uh, northwestern quarter, almost quarter of the, um, or sorry, northeastern quarter of the African continent. Um, and the sapropels are dark organic rich uh, layers indicating um, heavy monsoonal conditions, rainy periods, uh, and those are interrupted by um, uh, white uh, layers um, when the organic matter does not is not forming uh, at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea, indicating that this is a, a drier uh, time period. And these are groups, these black and white uh, layers. Uh, the sapropels are organized into, um, uh, into packets uh, with uh, which uh, Peter Domenical, um, uh, at when he was at Lamont uh, Doherty, uh, now at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, um, he and I, um, you know, were working on a variety of projects together and he helped me understand uh, this and that there are these packets of relatively stable uh, situation um, of uh, climate and versus times of uh, packets of, uh, of more unstable times where there's more, um, where there's stronger um, uh, fluctuations uh, between wet and dry periods. Uh, environmental sciences is a science of squiggly lines. And so, you know, one just has to kind of begin to dive in and figure out how to, how to um, think about this. This is the uh, Sapropel record uh, showing Nile flooding and, uh, and uh, relative aridity um, on a, um, uh, and it's a record that goes back 3 million years. You can see on the timeline on the bottom and the uh, vertical axis is one of color, basically, of spectral reflectance uh, or the amount of reflectance so that um, there is greater reflectance of, of light in the white from the white layers indicating a stronger aridity and the darker layers less spectral reflectance indicating high moisture. And you can see how the variability is grouped into these packets of higher and, um, and lower variability. And so this got me thinking about, okay, are we really dealing with this time period, say last 3 million years in this record, last 5 million years for the whole um, Sapropel record, um, and, um, and also the last 1 million years plus at the Lorgasile, are we really dealing with uh, organisms, including the hominins, um, being adapted or becoming adapted or staying adapted to the environment in a monolithic sense? And I began to say, hmm, Maybe that's not how we should be thinking, but we should be thinking about adaptation to environmental dynamics, to the dynamic properties of the um, environment. And so um, just as a, <clears throat> a general sort of cartoon, if you will, as to um, how organisms might respond and populations of organisms might respond uh, to a hypothetical sort of um, uh, moist, uh, dry or warm, cold, um, oscillation um, record uh, seen on the left here um, that a, a population um, uh, might uh, be able to um, uh, move back and forth. That's the in the red in the middle uh, possible scenario um, where the uh, light line in the middle uh, indicates the ability to move back and forth with the uh, fluctuations in an environment. In this case, it would be moved geographically. Um, and, uh, and that it can maintain a certain sort of level of adaptive versatility, a fairly narrow level of adaptive versatility to certain kinds of, of uh, foods or temperature conditions, moisture conditions, and so on. Um, and that's what most organisms do. Um, they have a relatively narrow range of adaptation, um, the adaptive envelopes, if you will. Um, and uh, and they're, they're, they've been able to, to, to move. 
Um, but then um, there's a worst case scenario where, where in a population uh, is not able to, uh, to move with the fluctuations, does not expand its uh, adaptive versatility um, and becomes extinct. Um, but then I began to contemplate this uh, third option seen on the right um, about becoming more versatile, about um, the, adapt the envelope of adaptive versatility uh, um, expanding. Um, and that the organism or this population would be able to move back and forth at first uh, with environments, but at the same time, there could be perhaps a selective process that would expand that, uh, that cone, that envelope of, um, of adaptability, um, such that it could begin to do new things and move into almost independently of environments because it had become uh, more um, uh, adaptable and able to buffer um, the, um, the, the changes and fluctuations and unexpected aspects of, um, of environments over time. Um, and so this led, and many of you, this is a repetition of things you've heard me talk about before, but the, uh, in this intellectual journey to this uh, uh, conceptual model of variability selection, um, a conceptual model um, whereby, um, again, in a hypothetical environment, um, dry wet sequence of environments seen on the right there. Uh, landscapes and the ecological resources would, uh, would change over time with regard to the um, uh, water opportunities, freshwater opportunities, food opportunities, uh, vegetation um, uh, areas to, uh, to uh, inhabit or to exploit. And that um, in each of those environments, there is a natural selection going on. Um, but what I en envision here is var variability selection as an integrative process. It integrates over time a process that affects the characteristics of gene pools um, over, uh, over time, uh, requiring then a sufficient uh, amount of um, variability in time and space uh, to do the uh, assembling whereby adaptive versatility is uh, ultimately uh, favored over habitat specific uh, types of um, genetic uh, combinations. And what this uh, suggested uh, is that if the, the temporal period of variability in question um, was clipped um, was uh, too, uh, too quickly, if it was shortened too short um, uh, and clipped by the return to stable conditions, uh, that perhaps this process would work and that habitat specific um, adaptations would, uh, would, would win out. Um, and so anyway, just to uh, define variability selection for you and to remind you of, about this, it's a process that I envision by which particular combinations or sets of genes are favored. That is, they're increased in the gene pool just as we, as we just saw in that heuristic model. Um, due to the instability in the survival conditions um, over, over time. Um, and it's a, a, the resulting adaptations would enlarge the options available to the organism, the ways in which a, a population or ultimately a species uh, uses its, uh, its surroundings. And so it's not a response. I do not envision the process as leading to a response to, uh, to any single environment, such as a grassland or woodland. Uh, its effect is not in response to an arid habitat or a moist one. Instead, it's a, a process of, um, um, of selection uh, to the dynamic aspects of the environment. Um, what I think of as um, adaptation to the spectrum of uh, change itself. And I think it is a, uh, a key um, to, oops, sorry, let me just go back here. Uh, I think it is a, um, a key to, um, some of the ways um, in which we can understand um, some important benchmarks in human evolution. Uh, so for, for example, the, um, uh, the emergence of uh, stone tool making uh, or um, uh, brain enlargement or the emergence of complex uh, symbolic language. Um, these would accordingly be conceived as adaptations that um, evolve due to the manner in which they promote behavioral uh, flexibility. Um, and so let me just also underline that environmental variability occurs at all time scales. There's a very strong relationship between seasonal time scales 
uh, of seasonal, say, rain patterns where the intensity or the length of rainy seasons or dry seasons uh, then ultimately affect uh, orbital time scales and the packaging of uh, variability that can be seen in orbital time scales. Uh, and then the ability to adapt to this variability, to the changes in uh, variance, tempo, predictability, uh, may be found at diverse biological levels. And so I see this as something that may potentially be useful, not just to paleoanthropologists uh, looking at human evolution, uh, but to a whole variety of, uh, of different organisms, not to overshoot too much on this. Uh, it's, it's still a, you know, considered a hypothesis. Some people say, no, it's no longer a hypothesis. It's a framework in which to think about the evolution of adaptability. However you wish to think about it, it's possible that um, uh, such a process of um, uh, response to uh, changes in variance, tempo, and predictability of um, the environment uh, may be found at a whole variety of um, uh, uh, in diversity of biological levels. Uh, and so moving on, jumping forward um, then to um, work that began in, you know, a few years after I developed, first developed this idea um, that began by working with um, a variety of, uh, of excellent, um, superb colleagues um, who uh, know about uh, climate variability, particularly in Africa. Um, they were pointing out that climate, African climate is influenced by the interaction of uh, the two different periodicities of precession and the two different periodicities of eccentricity. And that when you put the interaction of those periodicities together, what you find are alternating phases of high and low climate variability um, for tropical Africa with uh, possible, uh, and it's possible to make predictions about when the onset, where the divisions between low and high uh, should occur. And so that was published in Journal of Human Evolution in 2015, the article that you see um, cited at the, the bottom of the slide there. But what that article also um, tried to test um, was whether this, um, this framework of alternating high and low climate variability what had a, any interest at all with regard to uh, human evolution. And so um, a whole group of us uh, put together, um, you know, okay, what were the benchmarks at that time for the first appearances of main hominin genera, um, Australopithecus paranthropus, the genus Homo, um, the onset of uh, Homo sapiens with regard to the fossil record, key archaeological transitions, uh, the onset of the Oldowan, uh, the Acheulean, the Middle Stone Age, Late Stone Age, and the two typical geographic expansions. We know the topic of, of dispersal of hominins is far more complex than this, but the typical sort of out of Africa one and two uh, sort of scenarios. And it turned out that all of those, all of those um, benchmarks uh, fall into the uh, longest periods of predicted strong climate variability. Um, and so I was actually quite surprised by that, and uh, we we published it, did some uh, statistics on it, looking at null models, um, and um, and as there have been changes in a few of these benchmarks, uh, for example, genus Homo being uh, now a little bit earlier on the basis of the uh, Ledi Gararu uh, mandible, that actually happens to fall in the next earliest, or I should say the the the, the uh, preceding. Uh, longest long period of climate, uh, high climate variability. So it seems to be, at least the statistical thing is holding up, even though this doesn't necessarily tell us exactly what the process uh, was, but this association is kind of, kind of interesting, I think. And so uh, my work in recent years has been focusing on what I call um, high climate variability stage H2, uh, which has a predicted onset of uh, 358,000 years ago of the onset of that high climate variability period uh, and, uh, and ends at around, what is it, 60,000, something like that, uh, years before, uh, before present. And then this, so this leads us to the main example I'd just like to present uh, quite, uh, quite quickly here. Um, based on 2018 articles, um, they were published in the journal Science. Uh, but work that goes back to, that began in 2001, um, where we um, ended up uh, finding evidence of the Middle Stone Age 
uh, Adelorgus Sile. Um, I knew the Middle Stone Age, that Middle Stone Age artifacts were there from my first survey in 1985, but um, uh, didn't really uh, do much about it um, until um, I asked um, Allison Brooks and John Yellen, who have the um, perhaps the greatest experience widely throughout uh, Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, of digging Middle Stone Age sites. If um, they had a student, uh, if Allison had a student who could help me with this. And uh, she said, well, let me talk with John. And Allison and John came back the next day to my office and said, we don't want to work in Ethiopia anymore. And I thought, hmm, I said, do you want to do the excavations at Alorga Sile? And they said, yes. Um, and so um, that uh, was the continuation of a partnership that was, that's was that been very productive. And so um, through excavations like this, uh, where um, uh, I was able to join Allison and John in, in figuring out where to excavate, and Kay Berensmeyer was doing the geology, Alan Dano the, the continuing with the dating uh, of, the, uh, of the sites. And so we had uh, these four papers published in uh, 2018, three of them in, in science that you may be familiar with. And one of them um, that was uh, uh, on the geological context of this uh, formation that lies above the Alorgas Sile formation. The Alorgas Sile formation is where the Acheulean occurs. The Old Tulale formation is where the Middle Stone Age uh, occurs. And so the Bulletin of the Geological Society of America published that article the, um, the same month as the uh, articles came out in science. Um, and so um, I know this is a complex slide, but let me just uh, walk you through it very quickly at least. We have on the left observations for the several variables uh, in red there uh, from Alorga Sile. In the middle, we have what we see about those particular uh, types of variables for the Acheulean, and then on the right side, what we see in the Middle Stone Age. And so for artifact uh, tool size, uh, we see the large tools typical of the uh, uh, Acheulean, um, hand axes and other sorts of, of things um, at, that are uh, typical of the uh, Acheulean bold flaking. Um, and, but in the Middle Stone Age, we have a much smaller diversified um, set of tools. Hand axes do not appear in the Middle Stone Age at Alorgas Isle, beginning at about 320,000 years ago. The sites that we uh, focused on in the science papers are dated between 320,000 years ago for the lowest sites up to about 295,000 years ago uh, for the um, uh, upper uh, stratigraphic uh, level sites. Uh, the Lorgas Isle, um, the lithic source rocks, uh, coarse fine grain, local volcanic rocks, um, transport distances of no more than five kilometers for 98% of the rocks used in the Acheulean. Whereas in the Middle Stone Age, we have obsidian and chert obtained from outside of the basin and only the fine grain local volcanics. And for obsidian, we have um, sources based on um, chemistry, uh, of uh, obsidian, obsidian outcrops in the, east, uh, in the East African Rift that are 25 to 95 kilometers away straight distances. We estimate that the actual walking distances were about four times that um, due to the, rug, the rugged terrain of the, uh, of the Rift Valley. And we're beginning to do some, um, some modeling now of what kind of energy expenditures would have been involved in that if it, an individual were able to, to make that, uh, that trip. But on the basis of those distances, we um, concluded, and uh, this is in the Brooks et al. paper in Science, um, that it could very well be that social networks or some kind of exchange networks were involved uh, here rather than individuals walking that kind of distance uh, without chipping the large blocks of obsidian down to almost nothing by the time they got to Alorgas Sile. Instead, there's a lot of obsidian in the Middle Stone Age at Alorgas Sile. Uh, pigment use, um, none um, that are seen in the hundreds of excavations that we've done of Acheulean sites at Alorgas Sile. Um, and with regard to the obsidian, or rather at the, the uh, MSA sites, um, that we have, um, we do indeed have, uh, have pigments at uh, several of the archaeological sites there. Uh, depositional regime, relatively stable, ag um, uh, a grading system. 
associated with the Acheulean, whereas a much more highly dynamic landscape with a lot of basin cutting and filling or sub-basin cutting and filling um, with the Middle Stone Age at Alorgus Isle. And um, herbivora fauna, um, that there's largely a non-ruminant megagrazer uh, community that is fairly consistent, although the, the species change, but the overall ecological structure of the fauna stays quite, uh, quite similar. Um, whereas in the Middle Stone Age, um, we have smaller bodied, um, a mixed feeding uh, community that dominates. And then in terms of insulation, the precipitation dynamics um, based on the model uh, that I showed earlier, um, you have a combination of high, alternating high and low um, climate, predicted climate variability uh, for the um, Alorgus formation. Uh, and that's indeed what we think we see, um, whereas we have a sustained period of very strong high climate variability associated with the Middle Stone Age. So visually, uh, here's a way of summarizing all of that. Uh, 1.2 to 500,000 years ago in the Alorgus Isle Basin, about 700,000 years of uh, many, many levels of uh, Acheulean uh, technology and behavior represented there. And by 320,000 years ago, we have the Middle Stone Age, a time of, um, of innovations. Hand axes are gone, and we have um, a, the smaller, more uh, diverse, uh, I would suggest more mobile uh, tool technology. Uh, at the bottom of the slide there, you can see um, that we also have um, a um, pretty regular uh, Levawa technique or approach uh, that was used such that with uh, one strike um, that there is the multiple uh, times generation of uh, triangular points. Uh, we think based on the um, uh, retouch on the basis of those points, these points um, are about two centimeters um, uh, at the uh, at the base um, made multiple times that these could well represent projectile points. I know that there will be some uh, dispute uh, about that, but um, uh, the Brooks et al. paper makes uh, a pretty good case um, that I think that of why we think these are projectile points. Uh, we also uh, then have um, the uh, large amounts of obsidian that are brought in for the first time, so different from the Acheulean. Uh, suggesting that they're not groups that are going these long distances all by themselves and chipping it down to almost nothing by the time they get to the Alorgus Isle Basin, like what we see in the um, uh, Shulian, but rather there is could well be um, the exchange of obsidian in multiple directions, seven different directions, um, and uh, over those sorts of distances that I mentioned before. Uh, 25 to 95 kilometer straight line distances, perhaps four times the distance um, over the rugged terrain. And then we also have the uh, use of pigments, including the grinding of, uh, of pigments, um, of both um, red uh, and orange uh, uh, ochre um, that is not obtained from within the, the base, and we don't know where it comes from yet, as well as uh, manganese um, that is accumulated at particularly at one of the archeological sites, uh, 50 chunks or um, spherical uh, balls of, uh, um, uh, of um, manganese. Um, and those, um, the geochemical signatures indicate that those were uh, formed through an accretionary process that simply did not exist in the Alorgus Isle Basin during the time when we see that, um, that manganese, those manganese spheres uh, in, the, uh, in the basin. Um, so, so from some distance outside. And then we have the, uh, the big turnover in the fauna, about 85% uh, uh, turnover in at the species or taxonomic, uh, overall taxonomic level, which is a tremendous amount of turnover in the taxa. Um, well, what we see then is that uh, the Acheulean comes from the time period of 1.2 to say 499 or about 500,000 years ago. And then the Middle Stone Age starting at 320, and we have erosion in between the two. And so we do not have a record in outcrop. We have a hiatus uh, that's uh, pretty, uh, uh, well, it's hard to deal with. <laughs> and we were trying, trying to scratch our heads in the early 2000s, what, how we could deal with that. Uh, we already knew that that was the, uh, uh, the case. We looked for outcrops, couldn't find any. 
Um, and so what we did to try to fill in is that we went uh, to uh, drilling. Um, and for all you students out there who think you know what you're going to be doing throughout your careers, uh, if uh, you, know, you, you move on and continue on as whether it's a paleoanthropologist or whatever, uh, archaeologist, uh, and, um, but there are times where you just have to take a veer. And uh, I never thought that I would be involved in organizing a drilling project, uh, but so be it. Um, found the driller uh, in, uh, in Nairobi. Um, and, um, you know, we talked about how to do scientific drilling and they did a great job and they got a, a fantastic uh, uh, drill core out of the ground. Um, it, this is where you can see at the bottom where those um, drill sites are relative to the um, outcrops uh, that north of Mount Delorgas Sile. And uh, the, um, the distance uh, is about roughly 23 to 24 kilometers uh, apart. If you were walking from the Delorgas Sile outcrop that um, uh, contain, that preserve the record of the main evolutionary transitions, and you walk southward, um, through the Cora Graben uh, to the drill sites, um, again, 23 to 24 um, kilometer um, distance. Um, the, uh, uh, the drilling sites were uh, downstream of the Alorgas Island Basin outcrops. We can demonstrate connectivity between the outcrops and the, uh, and the drill sites. And so uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful core. Um, this just shows out of 139 meters of, uh, of drill core, 95% recovery uh, of uh, sediments during the drilling, um, a pretty, pretty good level um, and of, uh, of recovery. Uh, and you can see uh, evidence, for example, in the uh, paleo salts um, at the, uh, in the, in the core section on the, of, on the right. This is just a, a small part of the drill core, uh, but a paleo saw, and then you have the transition to um, uh, to lake waters and uh, varve-like sequences that are essentially seasonal records of, uh, of rainfall and, um, and dry periods. Uh, lots of volcanic um, tufts all throughout, um, very well constrained. The drill core is in by argon, argon uh, dating. And it actually looks like for at least going back to 1 million years ago, um, when you take, think about that whole time period of the past 1 million years, it's certainly one of the most, if not the most um, precisely dated uh, records, environmental records uh, in Eastern Africa, um, if not in Africa overall uh, for, that, uh, last, for that time period, the last 1 million years. Um, and so there are many, many different ways in which I could show you squiggly lines. We have so many different proxies put together. I would recommend going to the article itself that was published in October of last year, October of 2020 um, in the journal Science Advances. It's an article length um, treatment um, that deals with a whole variety of uh, proxies, indices uh, of environment that come from diatoms, that come from um, uh, phytoliths, uh, uh, microscopic silica bodies that plants leave behind, um, to uh, various isotopic records, um, mineralogical records, uh, elemental records you know, from scanning um, X-ray um, uh, 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 XRF, um, X-ray fluorescence um, uh, studies. Um, and um, so this is, instead of all those different um, uh, squiggly lines, I'm going to present you with this cartoon of what we found. Uh, so around 400,000 years ago, what we see is a major shift from largely stable habitat. So you see a timeline there from 1 million to about 500,000 or 400,000. And we actually, you know, all of the data indicate such amazing stability in terms of the um, freshwater availability and short grasses. Um, so the water supply, was actually quite strong and consistent throughout. And yet we have short grasses, which was surprising to us that we wouldn't have more vegetated environments if in fact um, there is such a good water supply due to precipitation. In any case, it's that period of stability, relative stability uh, that the Acheulean um, was, uh, that, that it's where we have the Acheulean in the Alorgas Sile uh, region and in the Southern Kenya Rift. But beginning about 400,000 years ago, we begin to have greater change in vegetation, water supply, the degree of fresh water, 
we see the change in that around, well, by 320,000 years ago to the Middle Stone Age and the, the turnover in the fauna. And actually it's around 360,000 years ago that we have another site at Lenyamok in Southern Kenya uh, that I excavated uh, before I got to the Smithsonian even, uh, that um, shows the evidence for that, that change, the change in the fauna had, had really begun to occur or had occurred by about 360,000 years ago, soon after this 400,000 year um, shift in ecological uh, resources and, and the shift toward fluctuating habitats. The, um, this is a, a, from figure one of the Science Advances paper published last year. Um, and I just want to emphasize that faunal adaptations are really important to consider. Um, it's not just about the hominins. The, one of the mottos of our uh, field studies uh, is that, um, you know, we've got to put the hominins in their place. Context means everything, <clears throat> things like that. And so what we see here is where time is now on the vertical axis. We have an outcrop, the Acheulean and the Middle Stone Age, and the hiatus when there is the replacement, uh, complete replacement of the Acheulean by the Middle Stone Age. The Acheulean never returns and the 85% taxonomic uh, faunal turnover. Uh, so that's that gray bar in the, uh, that stretches uh, uh, horizontally. And we have a variety of different um, faunal um, adaptations in a sense that we, uh, we, we talk about here. And so during the big herbivore uh, uh, transition, uh, we see there uh, on the, the left uh, pie chart um, dealing with um, body size, body mass, that there's that the large taxa uh, decrease um, across that transition, and we have a uh, an increase in the smaller bodied uh, mammalian uh, taxa. With regard to the water dependence, um, that water dependent species uh, decrease, and we have more water independent species that are um, in the uh, the faunal record uh, of uh, the Alorgus Eiley Basin. And um, the, with regard to feeding strategies, the mega grazers, those large bodied, um, what I call um, uh, Pleistocene lawnmowers and uh, eating grass have uh, functional adaptations uh, toward, uh, toward grazing. Those mega grazers decrease very significantly and you have more mixed feeders and browsers. And this suggested to me that perhaps what we're dealing with here is an increase and um, the adaptability of the fauna and the ability of the fauna to respond uh, to the kinds of ecological disruptions and ecological resource fluctuations that we see also in the, uh, uh, in the drill core. And for some reason, I've lost the ability to advance the slide. Let me try this. Um, so, so one of the things that um, we thought it's important to kind of think about is the larger herbivore ecology and particularly trying to understand why the water supply during the Alorgus formation would have been strong, but short grasses would have been the maintained ecological system uh, seen in the phytoliths, seen in the uh, um, uh, variety of other isotopic records that we find in the drill core. And this led me back to articles that I had read when I was a graduate student um, and about, and also um, in the mid 1980s about the ecology of grazing lawns where large herbivores exert a very strong influence on the vegetation and resource landscapes. And you can sort of read there what I wanna say, the, the, the grazing lawns are characterized by uh, short grasses that are kept in an immature state um, and a productive state by, uh, uh, by grazing. Uh, the lawns yield um, nutrient and energy rich, uh, low, low to the ground um, uh, vegetation. Um, and uh, in experiments that have been done with grazing lawns in the Serengeti and in South Africa, um, that those uh, nutrient rich, um, energy rich uh, grass um, eco, uh, landscape, grassy landscapes, um, if you um, sequester animals from, if you, uh, from areas that are like that, um, the rainfall actually produces tall grass and, and trees. 
And so we have a major way in which the uh, fauna is the large bodied fauna can uh, transform an ecosystem into a short grass uh, area, even in a time of relatively high uh, and persistent rainfall. And so these lawns are established more ready by very large grazing, uh, large bodied grazers than by medium and small grazers. And what we have in the Alorga Sile formation faunas, this is just gives one example from upper member one at 1 million years ago, a C4 short grass uh, landscape. Uh, this is an outcrop that we see this um, and dominated by these me mega grazing uh, taxa of elephants and large bodied zebra, a very large hippo, uh, the large metridio care pigs, uh, white rhino and uh, uh, large baboon, uh, Therapithecus alswaldi. And that's where the Acheulean in those um, ecosystems that the Acheulean toolmakers were hanging out. And so the South uh, Rift mega herbivores we maintain, or we, we think, we hypothesize, created and maintained short grass grazing lawns overriding the expected effect uh, of precipitation. Well, what could possibly have been other factors besides climate? and tectonics. We also have evidence that after 500,000 years ago, that there's a lot more tectonic activity going on in the Southern Kenya Rift, a fragmentation of the, uh, and faulting of the landscape. Um, and um, this is just within on the right side from um, Kay's uh, article in um, uh, the GSA Bulletin. Um, of even within the Alorgosile basin, the uh, formation of sub-basins that are generated by faults. Um, you can also see um, the tremendously faulted terrain if you look you know, broadly at these uh, maps of the Southern Kenya and Central Kenya Rift Valley um, and uh, a tremendous amount of relief that is created. And so basically you have a, a relatively uh, flat landscape uh, that becomes more and more faulted. And then beginning about 500,000 years ago, a um, tremendous amount of uh, topographic relief that is developed and the ability to of large grazing animals to have a long, a wide swath of, um, of vegetation to maintain as a nutrient rich, energy rich grazing lawn to maintain their large body size that would have been effective in maintaining their large body sizes just doesn't seem to be a um, possible uh, anymore. So also in addition, the tectonics are creating greater habitat um, partitioning and fragmentation. You have um, uh, grassy areas in the lowlands, but uh, quickly interrupted by faulted higher terrain in which uh, C3 uh, bushy and tree vegetation uh, is uh, populating um, uh, the, uh, the, the higher ground. And so you have um, some degree of population vicariance and loss, even for the large bodied animals we maintain that in order to get to another grazing area, they have to go around the, the, the faulted uh, topography and that the chances of um, population uh, loss um, uh, due to fragmentation of populations is uh, increased. This just shows you on the right, just one example of population fragmentation in lions. Um, and due to uh, actually due to human uh, effects these days. But we think that the um, tectonic fragmenta fragmenting of the landscape, partitioning of the landscape um, would have had a similar, not similar to humans, but a, a, an also effect um, creating vicariant populations and susceptibility to um, demise of those populations and ultimate extinction. And so um, what I now consider this then is an interactive system of causality. Uh, again, this is sort of like a mega hypothesis. Um, and I refer to this um, as the five facets of environment evolution connection in East Africa, but largely dealing uh, with this from the standpoint of the example that I've just given you. And the five facets that interconnect are climate, tectonics, vicariance, ecology, and evolutionary processes. Um, all of these facets, um, these five facets are necessary in explaining the transitions that um, we think that we have documented occur in the Southern Kenya Rift Valley, uh, but none by itself is sufficient. And so I think that we're getting beyond in this example that climate does it all, but rather it's this interaction 
of, uh, of uh, different variables that are uh, important in this uh, specific example. Um, I, it, may, it may seem strange to say that um, these, something like evolutionary processes um, are, um, not, are necessary but not sufficient. Um, but um, what I mean by that is that the processes do not continuously yield new adaptations. These evolutionary processes do not continuously yield new adaptations or species origins or extinction. But there are other factors such as climate and tectonics and the ecology of the fauna um, that um, uh, impinge uh, and that are um, contingent interlocking, interlocking uh, factors in uh, explaining why evolution uh, occurs at a particular time. And I think that this uh, way, this approach of looking at these different facets and how they interconnect helps to explain why um, events in uh, hominin evolution are irregular in their distribution through time. And I suggest that a big task ahead is to figure out the details of these interlocking facet, facets uh, for each example of evolutionary change that we seek uh, to explain. And so um, aren't, are we making some pretty big assumptions here and perhaps some have already come into your mind? Um, well, you know, I put Homo sapiens in the title. How do we know that the MSA record at Alorga Sile is related to Homo sapiens? The answer is we don't know. Um, we don't have hominin fossils from the uh, early uh, MSA or any part of the MSA at Alorga Sile or in the Southern Kenya Rift. Um, and yet the, the replacement of Acheulean by MSA behaviors um, in the, at the Southern Kenya Rift is or was concentrated certainly in a very intriguing uh, time period. Um, who was around uh, 320,000 years ago in, in Africa? Well, um, from Jebel Urhud, um, which I would see as uh, the more likely date is around 300,000 years. Uh, we uh, see part of a process of uh, the emergence of Homo sapiens morphological features. Homo heidelbergensis was still um, around. Um, don't have the, the main sites where we have Homo heidelbergensis fossils, um, and particularly earlier, back to the time of um, uh, in Ethiopia at Bodo at about 600,000, let's say. Um, the associations are, are with uh, Acheulean tools. Uh, Homo naledi in Southern Africa, no archeological remains as yet associated with them. And of course, uh, just to finish off this picture in other parts of the world, we have a slew of other um, hominins that are um, uh, around coming into being or still lurking around uh, at, this, uh, at this time period. So there's, uh, there's a variety of um, uh, cast of characters who could have been involved, um, but we do, uh, seem to see that some aspects of Homo sapiens morphological uh, distinctiveness is coming um, into the picture at around that time. Um, this is going to be a little bit of a complicated slide and it's a, actually from a preprint that came across my desk a couple of weeks ago um, that is um, in, has not been uh, published in peer review as, uh, as yet, but it has been published uh, uh, in as a, as a preprint, uh, looking at um, the expression of uh, human specific, Homo sapiens specific alleles, the uh, expression and the amplification of alleles uh, of uh, variants uh, having specifically to do in the human genome that have specifically to do with brain function. And the time windows are shown in the bottom there. I know you can't read them. So what I've done is I've highlighted the time window that they highlight in the, in the publication. And it's the time window between 300 and 500,000 years ago. And what we see are a whole variety of um, um, brain specific uh, expressions that become amplified um, from the molecular genetics and molecular clock side of these things in the 300 to 500,000 year for, or from 500,000 years ago to 300,000 years ago in that time window. And they say, isn't this an interesting time window that we should be looking at? Uh, and indeed we would agree. Um, and so what I'm trying to point out here is that we have some aspects of morphological uh, variation. We have some initial indication uh, pending still um, review, 
with regard to um, the genome um, of the Homo sapiens specific genome having to do with cognitive function. And we have the things that we have and other uh, teams are showing with regard to the behavioral change going on in this time window that we think is related uh, to the emergence of Homo sapiens. Uh, another big assumption, uh, well, we could be asked, why do you think that the proposed environmental drivers of change and, and ecological drivers of change in Southern Kenya represent the wider story across Africa? And the answer to that question is that we don't. Uh, we don't necessarily uh, uh, think that. Um, we're not saying that the Acheulean, we are not saying, let me emphasize that, the not, we are not saying that the Acheulean to Middle Stone Age transition took place directly in the Alorgosile Basin or even in the Southern Kenya Rift Valley. You look at Alorgosile on a map, you can barely see it on a map of Africa. It's a tiny pinprick in the, uh, of, of outcrops. And even if you take the whole Southern Kenya Rift, a small region um, of Africa. Nonetheless, we think that the ecological disruption uh, idea uh, presents a compelling idea uh, for, again, it's not just the, where the MSA developed, but the demise of the Acheulean coupled with its um, uh, replacement by Middle Stone Age behavior such that the Acheulean never uh, appears or reappears again after 320,000 years ago in the Southern Kenya Rift, including the Alorgosile Basin. Um, so there is much to look at with regard to other environmental records um, that uh, are in this time period. It could be that once aspects of the adaptability, which I'll get to in a second to finish up, uh, get to some aspects of the adaptability of the Middle Stone Age um, began to come into place, that it would have um, persisted not only in changeable environments, but also in stable environments. It would have been part and parcel of what um, Homo sapiens or the ancestors, uh, or perhaps representatives of near ancestors of Homo sapiens, um, what their behavior would have represented. And so um, some, many of you are familiar with the uh, McBrady and Brooks paper uh, from uh, 2000. Um, and uh, the timeline that they uh, showed of innovations uh, near the origin of Homo sapiens. And this is a, um, uh, a you know, there have been a few additions made that I've made to this, uh, this diagram, but through time, uh, they have from 280,000 years ago to about 40,000 years ago, a variety of things that are uh, connected. Uh, with the uh, emergence of Homo sapiens on the African continent. What we've done is taking, taken uh, several of these, four of these, and put them back uh, through time uh, beyond 300,000 uh, uh, years ago. Uh, and if you look at what these things represent, I would argue that these, well, they do represent increasing innovation relative to what comes beforehand in um, the hominin archeological record. Um, Wider social networks uh, certainly are involved. We think that these are also involved going back past 300,000 years ago. Um, the evidence for complex symbolic activity that are actually making its way into artifacts. We think that the coloring material uh, may also be related and the pigment processing may be related uh, to this. Um, as well as the obsidian ex exchange network or their long distance obsidian exchange, how you would maintain such long distance knowledge, um, mental mapping uh, of those uh, resources. We think that um, uh, symbolic exchange of information may have been increasingly important. Um, and then complex thinking and, and planning. And I suggest that these represent greater capacity to adjust to and to alter the surroundings or adaptability. And adaptability I would define as, and this is in our 2015 uh, Journal of Human Evolution paper, um, the ability of an organism to endure change in the environment, thrive in novel uh, habitats, uh, to spread to new places, uh, new, uh, new ecological and, and temperature and other kinds of habitat conditions, and to respond in um, new novel ways uh, to the uh, surroundings. These are certainly characteristics of Homo sapiens, and I see them represented um, at least initially in what we've been finding in the Southern Kenya Rift. And so the main points here uh, is that uh, with regard to the core, the drill core data, 
um, reliable uh, availability of uh, fresh water uh, over a period of at least 500,000 years ago that we can document in the drill core. Uh, and that corresponds with the uh, time when the Acheulean hominins occupied the Alorgas Haile Basin uh, in, the, uh, in the area, in the extended part of the basin toward where the drill cores are. Um, beginning 400,000 years ago, um, we see, at least by then, we see a rise in the unreliability of freshwater uh, oscillations in vegetation and the frequency of, uh, of dry episodes. Um, we have um, habitat uh, resource uh, unpredictability and episodic resource scarcity. We would suggest favored uh, wider hominin uh, ranges, population ranges, uh, longer distances of, uh, of transfer, of transport of resources that may correspond with this inference of exchange networks and the investment in information gathering and uh, social communication. Um, I, I know we're running out of time, so I'm not going to go through this. Um, I'm, I'm just going to pretty much skip this part of the presentation. But I wanted to let you know that we have thought about the, whether there are precursors in the Acheulean lithic technology of the Southern Kenya Rift. And um, we can see that the Acheulean was in the lower Alorgasile formation and upper Alorgasile formation. Uh, and the Middle Stone Age comes in the Otulile uh, formation. Um, and we have evidence, I'll skip through this very quickly, that in the upper Alorgasile formation, that we have a decrease in the size of, uh, of, of tools you see there in the box plot over on the right. And this is information that comes from our 2018 um, uh, paper, um, at least the one that I was first author on, um, where the size of tools uh, in the late Acheulean is much more similar, um, that is for flakes, flake, flake dimensions, than what we see in the, uh, um, uh, is, is comparable to what we see in the Middle Stone Age. Also, if you look at, um, well, we see evidence of the very delicately made hand axes, uh, blade cores uh, start to uh, come in in this time period. And um, that we also see um, greater evidence of um, use of uh, exotic raw materials, materials from outside of the Alorgas Haile Basin. This is all occurring in a time period um, where there is a threefold increase in the Alorgas Haile formation in the, uh, the, the tempo of lake land oscillations and also these red zones that are ind indicative of um, very, very wet times followed by intense drying dry periods. Uh, so these wet dry um, uh, fluctuations um, that lead to burning of, um, of a plant buried plant material, uh, a swamp plant material in the diatomites themselves. And so uh, we see extended steps in the tool making, a new focus on distant rock types, evidence of wider mobility, variations in Acheulean tool making. But these changes are ephemeral, or these variations are ephemeral. They don't last from one layer to another to another of the Acheulean. But we think that um, uh, these may represent the kind of raw material on which the Middle Stone Age uh, may have uh, originated from, whether it's in uh, the Southern Kenya rift or we think perhaps elsewhere in Africa. Let me uh, then finish with this uh, teaser uh, with regard to uh, DNA analysis indicates a, um, a, a split between modern humans and the Neanderthal Denisovan uh, genomes uh, that's um, centered on about um, 600 uh, thousand years ago, 600 to 650,000 years ago is where it's, uh, that time interval is, uh, is centered. And remember, we have this mandible uh, that I mentioned to you that we're um, doing an analysis of right now. And um, I'm not going to give away the whole picture, but the, the, the morphological traits of both the body of the mandible as well as the teeth are ones that are really an incredibly interesting mixture of stuff um, that are neither Homo sapiens, neither Neanderthals or Denisovans, neither Homo heidelbergensis, but a combination and an interesting mosaic of, uh, of much of it and, uh, and, and all of those different um, uh, sort of standard, if you want to even think of, especially not a Homo heidelbergensis as standard, there's nothing standard about heidelbergensis, but in any case, we find that this period of around 600, 615,000 years ago is a really, really interesting 
uh, time period for us to be looking at. Uh, and so current conclusions, just to wrap up, the Middle Stone Age replaced the Acheulean and the Southern Kenya Rift, uh, we think from 400,000 years ago to, we postulate, to at least 320,000 years ago, where we have the actual evidence uh, during active faulting, spatial partitioning, and episodes of resource unpredictability and scarcity. Uh, we would observe that human foragers uh, tend to increase their mobility and carry resources over longer distances in times of increased resource unpredictability and risk. And um, these are features we would claim of the earliest um, Middle Stone Age in Southern Kenya. Um, beginning 615,000 years ago in the late Acheulean, we see um, occasional um, uh, lithic assemblages of smaller or fine tools. We find assemblages that sometimes have longer stone transport distances, and that this appears in an adaptive con uh, context of intensified wet dry fluctuation. And so our hypothesis is that these late Acheulean variations in behavior are not the precursors, but there are examples of the types of precursors to the MSA and the evolutionary adaptability um, typical of uh, Homo sapiens foragers. Okay, uh, a tremendous number of people to thank, not just the funding agencies, but uh, our Kenya crew, uh, the Maasai uh, communities uh, with uh, whom we, uh, we work with and, and whose land we, uh, we work on, uh, Kay Berensmeyer, um, Allison Brooks, John Yellen, uh, Alan Dano, uh, Jennifer Clark, and many scientists and students who have, uh, who have helped us uh, in the fieldwork in the Southern Kenya Rift. So I thank you very much for listening and happy to take questions. Okay, cool. Um, thank you, Rit. So <clears throat> we do have some questions in the chat already. Um, Gopesh asked one, but he's actually said that you've kind of answered it already. Um, so I'll move on to Marta's question. It says, um, how did you choose the drilling site? Ah, hi, Marta. Um, yeah. Um, Sorry for such a lame question. I have many others. But no, that no, no, that's not a lame question. That's that's good. It's 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 like, did I have a divining rod and just, you know, um, yeah. Uh, OK. Uh, years and years and years of geological research indicated that the Cora area, that Cora plain, must have had a pile of sediments um, there that, that would represent the Alorga Siley formation. And if we were lucky, the gap uh, that we were in the outcrop gap because it was just a flat plain. So how could we possibly know? Um, and, um, but it's, it's that. And then, you know, when I got the, the, the drilling company to come out and the expert driller, he's, you know, we were, I said, okay, I think, you know, this is the area. He said, well, where do you want me to drill? And I just said, here and then over here. And so we had two uh, drilling uh, holes at 800 meters apart. And one of them, the first core that we, the one that we have published worked up, worked up um, is, was uh, 139 meters deep until it hit the, the basement rock of the Rift Valley, um, the trachyte. Um, and um, that's thicker uh, by a long shot than the combined Alorga Siley and Old Tula Lay formations and outcrop. So that's why we have such good resolution. And the other core um, doesn't go back as far. And it's very interesting. It, had, it hit a faulted part, a faulted piece of the, uh, of the Rift Valley and only goes back to, we think about uh, 350,000 years ago, but still an interesting time to look at and compare. Fabulous, thank you. Sure. Um, so then Michael asks, how representative is this area of other sites of hominin evolution? For example, would we expect to see similar climate st um, stability from 1 million years ago to 400,000 um, years ago elsewhere? Or was this period of climate stability more a local phenomenon? I think that um, it's uh, probably somewhere in between. Um, that, um, as I mentioned in the predictive model of um, African climate that we published in 2015, uh, that there are some time periods of higher um, uh, expected climate variability just due to uh, orbital parameters. Um, and, but they alternate um, relatively quickly with times of low climate variability. Um, and so, <clears throat> so I think it's going to depend, um, I think <clears throat> increasingly on the tectonic uh, uh, context 
Um, and that if you have a broad flat plain, then you're going to have the rainfall um, uh, distributed um, in ways that are you know, representative in let's say the lake records uh, of, um, of, of the relative stability. Um, but um, if you have a, a fragmented uh, topography, you're going to have tectonic effects on the uh, individual records. And so we really do not know, to be quite honest, what the effects of different tectonic settings where you would do drilling, let's say, uh, or even outcrop studies um, will, uh, will show with regard to this. And so we um, enter this into the record, the Alorgas Isle and Southern Kenya Rift uh, record, um, into the uh, record of what's known in East African, Eastern African paleoanthropology, and let's see what happens at other sites. I'm sorry, that's sort of a lame uh, answer, but it's as best we can do. Uh, I think that in every place that there's going to be a really good, solid, and relatively continuous record, uh, that it will be up to the researchers to figure out how those interlocking factors uh, all connect with one another, and perhaps other ones as well. Okay, um, and then um, Algis, or Algis, I'm sorry if I mispronounce anyone's names, by the way, um, has said, when I read your 1998 paper um, on the VS hypothesis, it was a revelation to me that savannah was not the dominant habitat, but there seemed to be an elephant in the room your evidence basically shows that throughout the period of human evolution, great shifts between wet and dry um, in increasing uh, phase and frequency. Your slide earlier um, showed evidence for grasslands followed by lakes. When we consider selection for variability in this scenario, aren't we really talking about selection for moving through water? For example, seasonally flooded gallery habitats would induce bipedal wading. Um, lakes would induce swimming and diving. The elephant is, of course, the so-called aquatic ape hypothesis, better labeled, in my opinion, waterside hypotheses of human evolution. Why is this always ignored? Uh, yeah, I tend to ignore it. Um, and um, sorry uh, if I if I am too dismissive of it. Um, but if you know, walking around the Eastern African landscape, uh, there are plenty of ways around water. Uh, you don't have to go through water. Now, does that mean that there couldn't have been, you know, um, wading in water? No, of course, it, it doesn't mean that there um, had to have been. Uh, it's just that the ways in which um, hominins can move around their environment, around water's um, uh, edges, um, or up onto a higher ground, higher terrain, um, one could easily, um, just as easily say that, um, well, gee, the great forgotten thing about um, uh, the uh, almost all of Africa, but but particularly the the, the uh, Rift Valley uh, area, uh, is that um, basins are called basins because they have high ground around them, and that what's really missing is our understanding of the higher elevation uh, areas where um, there would have been good drainage. Uh, and so I find it difficult to um, say that uh, water areas and having to wade into the water areas is an elephant in the room. We don't, we don't know. Maybe you would say it's a, a feasible hypothesis and I think perhaps, but I don't think it's a necessary one. Whereas I think that the variety of environmental records that um, uh, come do require us to think about environmental dynamics in a way that the variability selection, at least in, as a hypothesis um, um, deals with as well, what are the adaptive implications of it? So I know we could uh, go back and forth and argue about it, but um, that's my take on it. Okay. Um, so Larry has said, um, is the erosional gap in the Alogaceli sequence a signal itself of mid Pleistocene shifts in climate affecting depositional processes locally? What the, um, the hiatus uh, has to do with is the tectonics, is the, on, the onset. So basically you had the um, Alorgas Isle formation and a grading landscape. Yes, there were some pauses due to, and, and we have that with Paleosol formation, but overall it was the buildup of sediment layer after sediment layer after sediment, uh, sediment layer uh, in a, um, a, a, a basin that, was, that must have been um, a dropping um, uh, you know, relatively evenly um, over time. 
And then what happens is that you have then to the south a very, very dramatic beginning of um, uh, tectonic activity and downdropping, such that um, the Alorgosile Basin itself then becomes high ground, and therefore it becomes the place of erosion. Uh, and the hiatus occurs over 180,000 years, approximately, um, until things equilibrate between north and south, whereby you then have um, time periods where in some of the sub-basins of the Alorgosile uh, area, um, you have the resumption of deposition. And in those resumed de deposits in the Alorgosile Basin, the Acheulean is gone and the Middle Stone Age is there. Um, and so um, that hiatus um, has to do uh, almost entire, Adalorgosile has to do almost entirely with tectonics. Okay, um, next question is... Let me, can, I, can I just add yeah, something there though? That there is something else though to you, in which is important in your question. And that is that it's one thing for an area to be um, higher ground, but you also have to get all that sediment out of the Alorgosile basin. Um, and into the Cora Graben, and that you have to have water in order to do that. And that could mean seasonal flushes of water that gets the, you know, that, that does the uh, eroding. There's a lot, of bit, a lot of back and forth among our team of geologists as to whether it was, um, you know, whether in fact the, the climate oscillations that would have occurred starting around uh, uh, 400,000 years ago, um, we think um, would have been really, really important with uh, also helping to um, uh, accelerate um, the um, erosional and uh, uh, period uh, so that you're able to get that sediment out of the Alorgosile Basin. So just a little caveat there. Okay, um, yeah, so the next question um, has got a, a quote from your 2018 paper. It says, um, aspects of Acheulean technology in this region imply that as early as 615,000 years ago, greater stone material selectivity and wider resource procurement coincided with an increased pace of land lake fluctuation, potentially anticipating the adaptability of MSA hominins. So taking into account that there's um, a hiatus in the Alorgosaly formation after 500,000 um, 500, years ago. Do you think we can really talk about replacement of the Acheulean by the Middle Stone Age? Well, we know that the Acheulean was um, in the Alorgosaly Basin, registered in the Alorgosaly Basin layer after layer for about 700,000 years ago. The last 500,000 years ago is when we have the drill core, by the way, uh, but 700,000 years ago. And then when we pick up the Middle Stone Age um, that um, the, or when we pick up the, the next set of sediments at 320,000 years ago, the Acheulean is gone. So in that sense, yeah, there's a replacement. Was it an in, in situ replacement? We do not know that. And that's what I, why I was saying is that, um, you know, this is just such a small area of Africa. Transitions could have been going on at different ways and different, with different aspects of behavior in different parts of Africa. Um, but by 320,000 years ago, some pretty significant parts of the, of the Middle Stone Age, I think, were, re, were assembled uh, in the sediments and in our excavations that we have at, uh, at Alorgosile. One of the things that I want to clarify about um, the, uh, the quote uh, from the 2018 paper that was read is that those variations uh, in the late Acheulean um, during a, a time period of um, heightened land lake oscillation and of some fairly intense short-lived excursions from wet to dry and back to wet again, um, that those variations in the Acheulean are um, ephemeral. They do not stick around. Um, and uh, so you have some sites where the, um, the distance of bringing in uh, exotic raw materials is increased, but then at the next Acheulean site, we have up section, we don't have anything other than local raw materials being used. Or at one site where there may be very, very then finally made hand axes as well as evidence of some blade cores. That's around 609,000 years ago. 
um, actually, the next site you have above that doesn't have any of that stuff. And so what we're seeing then, what we're postulating is that the late Acheulean had under certain circumstances, the hominins who are making Acheul the, the Acheulean were um, able to begin to have this capacity to respond to these oscillations through longer distances of movement and more steps in the tool making process that we then see crystallized in the Middle Stone Age. And so, yep, we have that hiatus. We don't know the, the pace and pattern of that occurring within the Alorgus Isley Basin itself. Um, but we do know that the um, Acheulean no longer was a viable strategy, if we can say that, um, you know, after, you know, by the time it gets to 320,000 years ago, and by 320,000 years ago, what stays around are aspects of the Middle Stone Age. So that's why we looked in the drill core and we thought, well, at least something's going on at 400,000 years ago that seems to make sense of the adaptive properties, not only of the lithic technology and of the hominins, but also of the fauna. Okay, um, so Tom has said, you mentioned both social structure and symbolic evidence in this speculation or um, is this speculation or has anyone published any ideas about correlations between climate variability and either changing social living arrangements or the emergence of language as adaptive behaviors? Um, yeah, I don't know if anyone has put all of that um, uh, together. Um, in the 2018 papers, um, when you look at the relationship uh, among the three papers, well, at least the, the, the two papers, the one where I'm first author and the one where Alison Brooks is first author, um, that um, that's, that's how you would read it. Um, that we were not aware of what we were finding in the drill core at that say we had not put together all of the evidence at that stage when we put those 2018 papers together which was in 2016 um, but we had evidence from the outcrops that something odd was going on in the time period of the middle stone age outcrops um, and so i would say that it's really with our 2020 paper uh, in Science Advances, where we did the drill core, uh, describe the drill core, what our findings are for ecological resource, uh, ecological resources and the transition to a more disruptive kind of setting um, as the context in which um, adaptability would have been, and adaptive flexibility would have been at a premium that we also happen to see in the behavior signal that comes out of that um, aspects of um, potentially social, wider social connectivity, including resource exchange, um, pigment use, which some archeologists see as the root of human symbolic um, artifact uh, behavior. Um, of complex behavior. We know that that symbolic behavior must have been going on, or we think that it must have been going on before that. But to the point that it became so important that it becomes instantiated in the stuff that people brought to archaeological sites, I think that's a pretty interesting phenomenon. So um, yeah, I see the adapt that adaptability story as being told through the artifacts by the time you get to the early NSA. Um, so we have another question from Marta. She says, do you have um, an idea of the seasonal or yearly foraging range pre 500 Ka and post 300 Ka? No, <laughs> that's a simple answer. We, I'm sorry to say that we, uh, uh, we, do, we do not. Um, it, um, it would be very difficult in outcrop and also in the amount of time averaging that may occur in an archeological assemblage to be able to distinguish seasonality on, unless we did a technique that some people have used with regard to um, sectioning uh, teeth of the fauna. And, um, but that would tell us something about uh, what happened when those, those uh, animals, those herbivores were growing up as opposed to what happens necessarily during the time period of site formation. Uh, when the hominins were, were active. So it's, it's, um, it's a really interesting, important, but very tough question. 
Um, next question says, in addition to climate and environmental pressures, to what extent do you think hominin hunting led to change in large bodied animals going into the Middle Stone Age? Yeah, oh, my, I was a, uh, I had to be a diplomat on our 2020 paper with regard to the variety of opinions by our co-authors uh, on that. Um, you know, some of the co-authors um, wanted hominins. Oh my goodness, they're the ones who were killing off the large megafauna. And, um, you know, others said that the hominins weren't involved in, in killing off the large megafauna that it was, uh, you know, the ecological resource uh, uh, fluctuations and disruptions that were largely doing that along with the, including the tectonics. Um, what I would say, you, you can see, you can read um, what came out from my um, uh, diplomacy there in figuring out what to say uh, about it in that, in that paper and that it is possible given that um, the MSA technology that was developing um, in somewhere in Africa and that we see in uh, Adelurgus Sile by 320,000 years ago would be good candidates for um, projectile armaments of things that fly through the air. Um, and therefore that the hominins could have been um, a factor in the uh, demise of the large bodied fauna. But it's also possible that those, uh, if those are projectile armaments uh, that are uh, indicated by those uh, obsidian points and the repetitive making of them, that that is in, in a sense an accommodation to having smaller and faster prey around. Um, that it was actually a response to the ecological faunal changes that had already occurred uh, before um, those points were produced. So we do not know the answer to that, but that's the range of interpretations we have to deal with. Um, next question says, there are very few sites in East Africa between 1.3 and 1 million years ago. In this period, there is also um, increasing aridity. What happens in uh, Olorgosaly between 1.2 and 0 0.99 million years ago? Well, it's very interesting um, that we have at 1.2 million years ago, the first evidence of a lake basin having formed. Uh, and it forms in a relatively confined area of the present day Alorgosile Basin. Um, we have um, beautiful, large hand axes and cleavers, and we have evidence of um, actually pounding implements where the phytoliths uh, right up against the, uh, the pounding um, anvils um, show C3 vegetation. Um, and you go up to let's say 1 million years ago and uh, up stratigraphically and the uh, a paleosol that we have um, done paleo landscape excavations about 120 excavations in one paleosol stretched across the basin and it's a c4 landscape um, if you look at that is a um, uh, um, a warmth and uh, uh, aridity stressed environment um, and it could be even though those are only two, it's easy to draw a line between two data points is that we have evidence of uh, relatively um, C3 landscape and, and, and water coming into the Alorgosile Basin being um, uh, preserved in the Alorgosile Basin. And then uh, at 1 million years ago, you have a, um, a C4 um, arid uh, landscape. If you look at the um, carb, uh, carbon isotope um, data, that are the compilations of those data uh, for the last, you know, sometimes going back 7 million years, 10 million years. Uh, this is from paleosols. And you look at the uh, excursion at 1 million years ago over in, into an entirely C4 environment. Um, that's, a, that's, that's the Alorgus Eiley 1 million year data. Um, and um, so it's, it's possible that there, that represents drying out, but as I say, it's, it's, uh, you can't necessarily make a trend just because you have those two data points. We don't know yet. Um, next question is from John. It says, in Africa, we all talk um, time more than MIS stages, but in Europe at 420 Ka, the change from the Anglian glacial uh, to the long Hoxnian, I'm not sure how to pronounce that properly, uh, is really stunning. Any comment? 
Uh, no, I mean, I think that we have um, two separate but interrelated uh, teleconnected, to use the paleoclimate word, uh, climate systems going on uh, with regard to glacial, interglacial and higher latitudes, uh, including in, uh, in, in Europe. Um, and the uh, wet dry cyclicity, which tends to be on a more um, 20,000 year cycle, but then uh, organized into these packets dependent upon eccentricity, uh, which is what the dominant signal of the uh, glacial interglacial um, cyclicity uh, or periodicity, I should say, is, is all about. And so um, I think that there could be, there are times when there is definitely amplification of what's going on in the tropics and tropical latitudes, um, such as uh, in the uh, East African rift in the areas where I'm working, where there's amplification of what's going on due to, due to glacial conditions. There's, there's got to be a, a, you know, a, a connection there. And it could be that 420,000 might be an interesting place to, uh, uh, to look, but the um, the grain, the temporal grain that we're finding in these drill core data are such are so are so fine grained, uh, so that our sampling of the drill core uh, initially has been at about uh, every three thousand years, and we're finding you know tremendous fluctuations beginning at four hundred thousand years ago. Uh, some of the records, um, some of the phytolith records, some of the phytolith um, um, uh, ratios that we're dealing with, uh, indices that we're dealing with, indicate perhaps back to 420,000 that things are starting to happen. But the oscillations are such that you're not just dealing with a change from one major state, glacial, to say another major state, a, a warmer uh, earth. Um, and so what, one of the things that we're interested in is getting temperature. Um, out of the, the record. And that takes some uh, special oxygen isotope uh, data that we're trying to produce, um, our members of our team are. So we, we'd be really interesting if we can get temperature out of the drill core record and begin to compare it with glacial interglacial. Um, so it's a really important question. What are the connections between these uh, latitudinal areas? Um, so obviously we, we've gone over the time by over half an hour now. So are you are you happy to take more questions? I'll take a couple more. Yeah, I've got yeah. to uh, yeah. go and prepare for another talk. <laughs> yeah. Um, so if anyone's question doesn't get answered, then um, I guess they can email you. Or something. Sure. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so we do like two more questions, I guess. Uh, so Hugh says, um, a fascinating question is, of course, the emergence of language, either gradual or more quickly, but it's hard to imagine direct evidence. Will we have to infer its emergence based on other kinds of evidence? And if so, what kinds of evidence? Yeah, um, I think everything has got to be indirect. You know, we obviously all know and have probably said to ourselves or to classes of students, whatever, that, you know, words and grammar do not fossilize. And so how can we possibly uh, know? Um, well, the indirect evidence um, is uh, largely been through, uh, through art and the use of coloring material for that. Um, so we don't have uh, anything that would be called art, but we do have coloring material. The other thing though, that is of uh, indirect um, evidence and of, uh, is of interest to us is that how would a, um, a enlarged um, geographic network of resources be maintained? That is the ability to imagine and to communicate to others uh, a mental mapping um, that is um, uh, large and also how to get there. Or better yet, if we are dealing in fact with a social network, how you would communicate um, and negotiate in a sense with other social groups who may be living on top of obsidian sources or um, are part of an exchange network. We don't know what exchanges were going on, but how would you negotiate that if you didn't have some um, at least um, selection for um, putting at a premium the ability to communicate concepts and a sense of obsidian um, value uh, 
Um, obsidian is more valuable. You know, that, that rock that you, that you have over there, oh, I'll trade you some of this, um, oh, I'll say it, this crappy nephilinite that doesn't flake very well, but I have got a rock and you've got a rock, we'll trade. No, you gotta be able to negotiate and have a sense of values there that are shared. How do you do that if you do not have some kind of um, uh, cognitive um, value system that is symbolically transmitted? One could sit here for a long time and imagine how that might occur, but certainly those are the conditions under which um, uh, the development of what we know are characteristics of language, like the ability of displacement, of being able to talk about past, present, future, and distant places and mental maps uh, would have been at a premium. And so we think that um, the uh, occurrence of the, um, uh, of the, um, pigment material. Uh, while it doesn't say anything about what was spoken, um, it may be able to tell us or give a hint that during a time when the growth of human imagination and the ability, ability to communicate things that are, can only be imagined in the head, and you got to communicate that with other members of your social group and perhaps other social groups, all of that would have been at a premium. Okay, so um, last question from Gupesh. Are there any closed habitats like um, patches of canopy forest in the Kenyan Rift Valley um, during the glacial or interglacial period? While talking about C3 and C4 trends, even during interglacial phases, it mostly shows um, camp or C4 inclined vegetation, which might show consistency in the presence of open environments. Do you think long, uh, the long presence of savanna-like environments have supported the wider population expansion, uh, which is reflected in raw material transportation, mostly after 500,000 years ago? Well, let me go back to the original part of the question, which is the premise of the latter part of the later part of the question, um, that um, there are on in high terrain, uh, like on mountaintops, there is the probably the maintenance of um, uh, bushy and woody vegetation, um, nothing like a closed canopy rainforest necessarily. Um, but <clears throat> let me also point out that um, a lot of the evidence with regard to, um, oh yeah, you have variation in uh, woody cover, but it's all pretty savanna, is largely coming from paleosol data. And in our drill core data, we have 30 paleosols and every single one of those paleosols is a C4 dominated environment. In between those, where the phytolith record also comes from and where we have leaf waxes, the microscopic materials, waxy materials that get sloughed off of leaves of trees and grasses, that we have plenty of evidence for uh, much more closed conditions. And so the paleosols are only giving a snapshot of the picture. It's a wonderful picture, but it's a very astute blind man touching one part of the environmental elephant. Um, and that um, in the leaf wax records and the, um, some aspects of the phytolith records, uh, we're seeing much more in the way of uh, C3, including C3 dominated environments uh, during the period of um, uh, disruption uh, beginning at 400,000 years ago. Um, and I think that's important to consider. We have a paper right now that's in um, revision for Journal of Human Evolution um, on the leaf waxes. Um, a young colleague, Rachel Lupian, um, who is, um, uh, did that for her PhD, part of her PhD thesis. Um, and she's having trouble convincing people that the end member uh, for C3, C4 uh, on the C3 side looks like a closed canopy forest um, that's um, being drawn from the catchment of those leaf waxes is not only within the Cora and Alorgus Ile Basin, but also beyond it. Um, and so we think that um, there's a much more complex and intricate picture than just saying it's savanna, savanna, savanna. Yeah, some variations, but it's just savanna. Um, so I'm not quite sure where that leaves us with the second part of the question. Okay, cool. So I guess we can end it there then. Um, thanks everyone for the, the great questions and, and thanks for coming along today. Thanks, thanks Thank to all you. of you.
Yeah, thank you, Rick, for um, answering so many questions. You must be worn out now. <laughs> Just getting started. <laughs> it's the end of your day. It's still the sort of middle of mine. Yeah, it's getting late here. <laughs> Yeah, we'll end it there. I hope to see everyone next week anyway. Take good care, everyone. Bye-bye for now. Bye, everyone.